Good every good day everyone. Thanks for um, joining us for this webinar. My name is Dusty Sievertson. Uh, I'm in the Crop Protection Group, and I've been with the department for almost 12 years now. And I'll be presenting on drones and their use in agriculture. Um, as we go through this webinar, if you have any questions, it would be good if you could um, put them into the questions um, section of that little um, thing there, if you could type them in, um, just so that they're there uh, by the time uh, the webinar is finished, that would be great. Um, here we go. So what I'd like to discuss um, is a little bit on drones, but probably more so on their applications in agriculture, what we actually do with them, what we achieve, and the benefits of that um, in agriculture. And I'd also like to go through some basic background on what we do with image data, how we use it, um, how it actually benefits growers in the end, um, and that sort of thing. And I'll give an example of one of the um, studies I did in my PhD, which I finished in 2016, where I used a drone um, in some uh, research trial site um, plots at Williams. So drones have had a a few acronyms thrown at them, I think. Um, UAV probably is the the most common, but unmanned aerial systems, I think, is probably the one that we're going to see more moving forward. Uh, and I think that's really because it's not just a vehicle, um, and it's often not piloted at all. So you can see here is an example of a flight path that might be pre-programmed in a drone to fly, where it's not piloted by anyone um, at all. And so the idea there is that um, images are taken along this flight path um, and programmed so that the images are overlapping enough to where they can be stitched together um, and have an, a number of sort of corrections done to them to have one large image. Um, so the, the most common ones that we sort of come across, I think, are what's called the fixed wing, which is, looks like a miniature version of a plane or a jet and also the, the rotor or copter type um, drones that you can see there, often up to sort of eight, um, eight rotors at a time. And we've got some other tiny ones that people are sort of working on at the moment, like the hummingbird one there. But we've got some other ones that are creeping into agriculture, such as this one from Yamaha, which you can see is quite big. And the payload is, is big enough to carry a pretty significant amount of um, in this case, chemicals to be sprayed. Uh, I saw some um, a presentation of this on TV not so long ago, where you can't actually apparently even even purchase these. They have to be leased um, because they sort of cross over into a category um, that has to be monitored a bit more closely, according to um, the Defense Force and that sort of thing. There's some security issues and whatnot, uh, but. Certainly, it, it, it um, is being used in rice, for example, very successfully to apply chemicals and whatnot. And we also have very large drones, such as NASA's Global Hawk. Um, so generally, they're classified by size and weight. But the major uses in agriculture that we see are remote sensing, whether that data is mapped or not, um, and then applications in precision agriculture. Also being used for spraying, as we saw, and pest control, and even so, um, spreading seeds. But generally, the space that we look at, um, the majority of, of drone usage is in, is in the space of remote sensing and, and um, precision ag. And then the types of image data that we acquire from these are anywhere from RGB, which is just simply red, green, blue um, imagery, which is the same as what you would use in your um, your mobile phone camera, through to multispectral and hyperspectral, getting into um, some visible and uh, infrared um, images as well. So we'll. We'll have a look at these and how they're how they're being used at the moment. So the image data itself is really being used to detect something. In this case, it would be crop biomass is probably the biggest um, application, but there's a 
enormous amount of research at the moment looking into particular stresses in crop plants, whether it's abiotic with nutrients um, and water, including thermal imagery, which is referring to infrared um, sensors, which is really handy for targeting irrigation and that sort of thing. Um, and also biotic stresses to see if we can detect pests and diseases um, and see if there's actually specific spectral signatures associated with those that we can use. And certainly image data is being used to detect weed infestations and uh, also various soil properties. So you can see the image there um, where on the right you can see this color-coded uh, map which says NDVI. We'll have a look at what NDVI is and why, why we use it and why it's useful. But also you can see that this particular image is then being used to um, create a map to be directly used in a, a precision egg setting in this case. Um, different rates of, of nitrogen applied to a cornfield to target where it's needed the most. So what is an image really we're all familiar with not so long ago, the, uh, the old photographic film, um, which was really just light sensitive um, silver halide crystals, doesn't really provide any data as such, but when we moved into this digital imagery, we have these sensors that we're collecting um, basically reflectance information. In this case, it would be in the visible spectrum that data is then mapped into what what we see as, as an image. Um, zooming into that image, you can see in the bottom, we end up with uh, what's presented as little squares, um, which have been made popular by a, a Corny Adam Sandler movie called Pixels. So we have these pixels, and if we look at a image with just at a single wavelength, you can see we have we have um, a two-dimensional um, digital sp um, or space, I guess you can say. For each pixel, if you um, then look at what sort of information is being taken from each pixel um, in the visible spectrum. It might be anywhere in that range there that you're going to end up with a certain um, a certain color that's there. And then when we start moving into multispectral and hyperspectral images, especially hyperspectral, so multispectral is anywhere up to sort of uh, 10 wavelengths being recorded, and hyperspectral is generally um, above 10. So we end up with basically a three-dimensional data set that, that's called a data cube. So you can imagine if you have a hyperspectral camera that records 240 bands in, a, in each uh, pixel, you have um, an enormous amount of information here. The benefit, or so I should say the downside of that is you have this enormous file size. And this is why they're saying, referring to this sort of technology as, as big data. It's really enormous data, um, but the benefit is you can start asking questions with this data, such as out of, in this data cube, what can, what can I use to differentiate X from anything else in this image? Or it might be, how can I differentiate four classes of things, whether that's um, four levels of, of, of crop biomass from everything else in the image. So where things are difficult, to differentiate, um, having that enormous amount of data gives you much more um, of a chance to actually be able to differ differentiate what's going on in a, in a particular image. And re referring to um, sort of drone acquired imagery, I like to take a step back and look at satellites. So these are examples of, of, of satellites that provide um, services that are considered very high resolution uh, and a lot of satellites produce much lower resolution but if I draw your attention to for example the world view three and four where it says 0 0.31 meters um, that's essentially the size of the pixel so if you can imagine a pixel 31 centimeters by 31 centimeters and then you picture that in a in a field setting say a wheat crop um, say a seedling wheat crop, 
you can imagine that there will be quite a few um, pixels that aren't planned. So we, we run into these issues where we want a higher spatial resolution. They all provide different spectral um, services. This sort of, some provide different near infrared um, data as well. Um, so they're all quite different, but really it's the spatial resolution is one of the things that's really driving, I think, drone use because um, drones have so many more advantages over over satellite acquired imagery. For example, um, you can run into problems with clouds and, and weather. Um, drones are on demand. You can use them whenever you want. Often um, satellites have to be scheduled, so that can cause delays. Um, there's definitely reduced cost using drones depending on what it is you're after. Um, and as I mentioned, flexible bandwidth. So with a satellite, you're you're stuck with with basically the sensors they have. Um, with with the drone, if you want a particular um, band that you want data acquired from, you can you can put that you can put that in. Often these multispectral cameras, you can pick whichever ones you want and put it into the one camera. And the higher spatial resolution, we'll have a look at why that's really important as we move forward to um, detecting stresses in plants. So all of this though is really leading to early detection, fast diagnosis, um, and corrective action, but also precise action. So variable rate um, technology, which is being used in, in precision ag, um, I think we're also going to move towards targeted, more targeted action where drones, for example, will, will go to where um, a particular, particular input is required rather than a boom spray going around with um, sort of variable rate. So what do we do with this data though? Um, firstly, there's a lot of research going on, so it's sort of trying to be able to detect what it is we want to detect before we can we can apply it in the field. So there's a lot of that going on. And there's various statistical approaches, um, even moving in towards artificial intelligence and machine learning, which I've heard there's a lot of research in China going on in that to, to try and overcome some of these issues when we're trying to ex extrapolate um, these tools across different varieties of crops and different um, just different settings there's a lot of issues with that so perhaps machine learning can overcome that um, but really it has to do with the questions that we're asking um, but, and what what which wave bands can we can we use and what is the classification accuracy is another really important question if you can detect something um, with 100% accuracy that's great but we start moving into sort of 90 80 70% accuracy. Is it useful in the field is the, is the question. We also have a big area um, where drones are being used to acquire image data to be used um, or, or displayed as a, a spectral index, which we'll have a look at, um, to try and uh, contrast something of interest. So what is a spectral index? Well, here's a, a list just um, to show that there are a lot around. There's, there's many more than that as well. Um, but there's one particular called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index that stands out as the most widely used and the most consistently used um, spectral, spectral index. We'll have a quick look at why that is and how it actually works. So spectral index is a combination of spectral reflectance from two or more wavelengths that indicate the relative abundance of features of interest. Vegetation indices are the most popular um, in agriculture, obviously, but it's quite a simple algorithm. So for each pixel, it's taking um, two bands. One is the red, which is usually 680 nanometers, and one is a near infrared, which is usually 800 nanometers. So for each, for each pixel, it's simply two, the data from two um, wavelengths or wave bands recorded. And then that, that algorithm there is run where it's simply the, the value of the near infrared minus the red divided by the sum of the two. So let's have a look at, at why um, 
that's able to contrast what it is we're after. Oh, so firstly, I'll give an example of how of how this is mapped. This is an example from Stratus Imaging um, where they've run the, the NDVI and they've mapped it and color coded it. Um, and they've, they've put it into three, what they think there is three classes from very healthy plants to poor, poor health and severely stressed plants. Um, so the green is, is very healthy and you can see there's some edge, edge stress is going on there um, as well. And it was interesting that they compared this to a yield map and a lot of that, I don't know if correct, corrective action was taken here or not, but a lot of that sort of correlates visually. You can see what's going on there. So we have this situation where a lot of um, drone companies, but uh, service providers as well, are um, providing this, this NDVI. So why is that? Well, let's have a look at some a typical reflectance um, from, from plants is basically if we see on the x-axis, we have the wavelengths, the visible, you can see the red, the green, and the blue. And then as we move to the right of that, we very quickly get into the, what's called near infrared. So automatically you can see plants are absorbing most of the red, green, and blue. Uh, and it's just slightly less so green, which is why plants look green to the human eye. But as we move to the right of that, we hit what's called the red edge, where it moves into the near infrared and plants typically reflect most of that. And so you can see, as they've indicated in this picture, the, the typical stress re response of a plant is firstly, it starts reflecting more of the visible spectrum because photosynthesis is compromised, um, less chlorophyll is being produced. There's quite a few other complex biochemical um, things going on, but also typically the um, it starts absorbing more of the near infrared. So it's this um, this sort of trend that the NDVI is using. So you can see the two red lines, two red vertical lines. Those are the those are the bars or the bands, I should say, that are used in the calculation of the NDVI. So healthy vegetation is going to have a much higher NDVI value, and then as that stress response becomes more pronounced, that NDVI is gonna start dropping off. So it's not just in, in, to differentiate um, plants from everything else, so we, we, in, in terms of stubble and soil and whatever, but also in, in, in individual plant pixels as well, we can, we can start getting some information about whether plants are stressed or not. If we expand that x-axis even further, and go from the near infrared to even the, the medium infrared, um, you can see that these typical responses vary quite a lot depending on how far you go in the spectrum. And so people are using all, all sorts of bands in that range to try and detect certain things of interest. So let's have a look at a couple of examples. This is a... Um, study with potatoes, you can see already the typical um, plant stress response where the, um, the, the low nitrogen treatments, you can see the, the red and the green are reflecting more and the near infrared is certainly absorbing more. And so that red edge is quite a lot steeper in the healthy um, high nitrogen plants. Here's a interesting study looking at um, stripe and leaf rust in wheat. So you can see the the healthy leaves are, which is the dark blue, um, absorbing most of the visible and reflecting um, more of that um, near infrared. Interestingly, you see the, the incubation period of those rusts kind of follow suit with with those reflectance lines apart from a little bit of segregation in the near infrared, 
but overall it's kind of indicating that in the incubation period it's not really stressing the plants that much. <clears throat> um, but then as we move into what they're calling the diseased period, the um, reflectance increases quite a lot in the red, green, and blue, and it starts dropping um, in the near infrared. So again, the same same sort of response. We see a, the same response with um, a caterpillar called the rice leaf roller in rice, which rolls leaves. Um, and this was interesting because it sort of shows incrementally, depending on the, the rate of leaf rolling, especially in the near infrared, we can see that that reflectance is dropping. So it's absorbing more, more of that um, spectrum. And as you can see in the, in the visible, there's something going on there as well. And here's another one showing the same stress response, um, which are Ru Russian wheat aphid infested crops in the Southern US. The top two figures are from the same crop at two different times and the bottom two are different crops. So you can, again, you can see the same sort of trend is happening. So this information is, is being used um, to detect that. But again, you can see that if you were to look at band 680 and 800, that difference is going to contrast in if you were going to apply something like a, a NDVI. So if we go back to that NDVI map of corn, firstly, what I want to point out is the fact that the the scale that they've color coded um, that scale varies. So whenever people throw up an NDVI map, it doesn't ne necessarily mean that the colors are going to correspond to the same. So people change those. Um, according to what they want to display. So in this case, um, because the values of NDVI go from minus one to one, they've classed um, well into five classes there. So the green being the, the highest value, which would be more healthy plants, it's reflecting more near infrared and absorbing more of the, um, of the visible. And then again, using that, they, they've, they thought that was a good enough um, sort of classification system to apply um, into a nitrogen application program. All right, so I'll just talk a bit about um, what I did in part of my PhD looking at detection of potassium deficiency in canola um, using a multispectral camera and also taking plants back to the lab and taking hyperspectral images. For, for comparison. And then I looked at uh, green peach aphid infestation and how basically potassium deficiency um, really increases the numbers of green peach aphids on plants and how they, how they reproduce on these plants. So just a brief background on the trial itself. They had um, a number of fertilizer regimes look, focused on, on potassium as the limiting factor it was two by 20 meter plots with three replicates and randomized block design. So I focused on these, these treatments with zero kilograms per hectare of um, myriad of potash as a form of potassium and then 50 and 100. Those were applied each year from 2009. And then a residual treatment, which 400 kilos was applied up front and then none after that to see how that that residual effect um, worked out. So we we did a number of nutrient our soil and plant nutrient analyses to really ground truth what was going on. And then I flew um, a multi-spectral camera at 15 meters and 120 meters. 120 meters is the legal height that we can fly uh, in Australia. And then we'll have a look at some of what happened in the hyperspectral imagery as well. So I used a mini MCA6. You can see there's six, basically six cameras there. You can you can take them out and add other sensors if you want. So there's a bit of flexibility there. Um, and Matt here from uh, SensorM was a CASA certified uh, pilot. So he flew this one, this octocopter. So at 15 meters, what I ended up with was a pixel size of about eight millimeters, so below a centimeter. 
Um, I then looked at some filters to say, well, if I can, I can analyze these images as they are, but there's a lot of soil there as well. So if I can just take out the pixels that, that are plant and don't have much shadow and that sort of thing, can I analyze that as well and see what's going on just with the plants? And this is one of the problems with um, spectral indices, for example, where they're often using all pixels and you can start getting these dilution um, things going on where soil, even whether it's wet or dry, can start impacting on your data quite a lot. And then at 120 meters, um, I did the same. You can see in July, the plants were quite young, around six leaf, and then August, the canopy was really starting to fill out. And then September, we had some flowers to deal with as well. For the sake of time, I won't go into it too much, but with the soil and plant nutrient analyses, it, it really consistently showed that the low potassium treatment was certainly deficient, but the other three treatments um, were considered sufficient, sufficient enough to give optimal plant growth. And then in September, we had an infestation of aphids. So that confounded the remote sensing data, but I could at least use July and August um, data. Looking at the multispectral camera, so I mentioned there were six bands. We can see the, the blue, green, and red in the visible and the typical response going on here, which I showed before. Fortunately, the sufficient K treatments showed similar reflectance even in the near infrared. And the deficient potassium treatments, um, especially in August, showed that separation. So that gave me a bit of confidence that we more than likely are going to be able to um, to differentiate this, differentiate um, potassium deficient canola areas from from sufficient. So when I did some discriminant analysis on these on this data, I found some interesting things. Um, the classification classification accuracy was quite high for the 120 meters um, compared to the 15 meters. Um, but if you see on the right, we have a list of the bands that were used to say um, at these bands, um, the values of those, those pixels, these are the bands that were, that were the most accurate in being able to um, to differentiate potassium deficiency. So from July, it was actually using band three and four, which is red in the near infrared. But then in August, it was actually, it's saying I can, I can get 100% classification accuracy, but I'm using completely different bands. And again, that happened in September. So there are issues here with extrapolating even just one particular time point. Um, with other time points and that sort of thing. But it's good that we could get very high classification accuracy. And you can see when the three dates are combined, the accuracy drops even more. So at 120 meters, I would only get 75% accuracy if I was using that particular model. And when I took plants back to the lab to conduct hyperspectral imaging, the question I was asking here is with this camera, instead of having six bands, I had 240 bands in that visible and near infrared um, spectra. So perhaps there's, there's better bands that we could use that weren't necessarily um, used in that, in that multispectral camera. But it was interesting that I had a, a, that similar stress response um, again, these are only plant pixels, so there, there's no soil or stubble or anything confounding the data, but it's saying that there is a stress response going on, especially in the, um, the visible spectra there. And just some things to point out that I think are important, that the detection of stress in plants is confounded when all pixels are used, as I mentioned, but also these, these indices that are used um, they don't tell you the cause of the production limitation. So whilst we can 
we can get all of these um, sort of typical stress responses. For example, if I, if I saw this in the field, I wouldn't be able to say that it was potassium causing that. So this is one of the problems with reflectance data is we want to find a particular signature for one thing, but if a whole number of things, pests, diseases, nutrient deficiencies, if they all, for example, compromise photosynthesis, and then that's reflected um, in, the, in the image data, then you're, you're not going to be able to know what actually caused it. So ground truthing um, is a really important part. Another um, interesting thing that I want to point out with the multispectral data, if we see the NDVI values on the x-axis and what's called the leaf area index on the y, Basically what that is, is in a given area, it's the percent of pixels that are, that would be considered plant pixels. So it's not surprising that at 69 days after sowing, you can see the circles, the leaf area index is lower, so the plants are younger, and then as plants grow, that canopy starts filling out and you can end up with saturation, which, you know, 100% leaf area index is, um, 100% leaf pixels in that area. But what's interesting here is at 69 days after sowing, which is here, we have this, this thing going on where if you were to use NDVI to try and distinguish deficient from sufficient, there's too much overlap. So you're going to end up with quite a lot of er error. Um, whereas leaf area index is showing quite a good separation there. And then if we look at the August imaging where the plants were, um, were older and the canopy was much thicker, we have the opposite where leaf area index is not a very good thing to use to differentiate, but NDVI is, which is kind of, um, kind of expected, I suppose. But what that illustrates is that using NDVI is, isn't the be-all and end-all for everything, and it really depends on what sort of questions you're asking, I think. And just to throw this one in, doesn't have much to do with drones, but the green peach aphid assessments did certainly show uh, much higher numbers in the potassium deficient. So rather than potassium being just a, oops, just a production limitation, um, we have all of these um, flow on negative effects such as pest and disease um, susceptibility, unfortunately. Oops. So I talked a little bit about drones and their application in agriculture, at least they're more common ones, and some background on image data and how we use it, some of the problems with it, and um, some of the benefits, and then just one study that I did. And I'll just end with an article um, from last month in Drone Life where they're saying taking aerial images, thermal or not, which is referring to infrared um, sensors with drones to map fields is the first step in using drones for precision agriculture. But around the world, as regulations allow, drones are used for much more. Replacing expensive and time-consuming manned aircraft solutions, drones are used for all kinds of crop spraying applications, saving both money and crops. So I think it'll be really interesting to see this take off in broad acre agriculture, um, where if we can detect something well enough, if, whether, if it was a pest or a disease, and then a drone could actually go and target that, um, that would be pretty amazing. All right, so I'm, um, I'll leave it there, and I'll just have a look here for questions. So I don't have any questions listed here. Well, there's always going to be questions. Um, yep, Dusty, yeah. Rob yep. here. Um, you know, my uh, gut feeling is that the closer you can get and the smaller the pixel, the more information you're going to get. But your observations included um, situations where the the interpretation was more straightforward or more accurate from a higher elevation. Mm. Any sense of what was going on there? Not really. I think um, there could have been issues with uh, the 
So NDVI, for example, um, will how do I explain it? Uh, there's there's a stress response from the plant which is changing the reflectance, but then all of the other things in the um, the, the shadow and the stubble and the soil are shifting those those reflectance responses as well. And I, I, I'm, I'm just guessing because what, what we had to do is we had to come up with filters to try and remove that. And I think the filters were at, fi at 15 meters were able to get more pure pixels. And what that was indicating is that the, st the stress response in the actual plants was much more subtle. Whereas because the plants were causing a much reduced sort of leaf area index like the plants were getting stunted from from the potassium deficiency that it was actually picking up more of the leaf area index effects i think that's what it is so basically the the plants themselves had less stress but the fact that the, the, the plants were um stunted was having more of an effect so and that's the problem, I suppose, that you, you can't say, if you see that in a field, you can't say that's potassium deficiency. You'd have to go and check it out. And then you'd see stunted plants. And now you have to figure out why they're stunted. So there's, it's a yeah, pretty major, pretty major limitation on, um, on that, I think. Thanks, Dusty. That's a helpful explanation. Um, somebody says, Christine says, just wondering if you have done any work on crop ground cover. Um, no, by ground cover, um, I guess you mean soil or plant, I'm not sure, but um, just, I guess, reflecting on that comparison of leaf area index with um, with NDVI, yeah, it's, it's, it's important to know what exactly is out there and what's causing what's causing the differences in reflectance with what it is you're comparing, I suppose. I don't know if that answers your question, sorry. Any other questions? Hi, Dusty, Tim Another here. question here. Yep. Oh. Um, I'm just wondering uh, what kind of regulatory limitations there are to adopting uh, drone usage more widespread across industry and whether you think, um, you know, it's a possible that they'll ever be overcome. Whether they'll be able to what, sorry? Whether, whether we'll actually be able to overcome them, show that there's enough uh, potential benefits from using drones for these kind of applications. That, um, yeah, uh, I mean, make away those regulatory burdens. Yeah. Um, I mean, with with um, a drone recently getting hit by a airplane, I think it was. There's going to be more and more tightening on what's going on. But at the moment, if your drone's less than two 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 um, kilos, you don't really have to do the training. But I mean, depending on what it is you're doing, we have drones now that only just recently that are less than two kilos and can certainly give you most of what a lot of these. Um, companies are offering such as NDVI and whatever there's even a, a, a company that's released a live NDVI video feed from a from a sm small drone so I think those sorts of things will be useful but for for the industry overall I would imagine this would be a service there's a lot of service providers out there now and there's even seems to be more and more um, but they will I think meld with precision egg sort of consultancies there'll be people that offer this type of service, especially hyperspectral stuff where people want to start looking into um, either lots of bands or bands um, sort of in the more of the medium and far infrared and that sort of thing. I think it's something you'll have to pay for and I don't think farmers are going to be going to be doing it so much. Sorry, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dusty. Yeah, no worries. Got a question. Um, have you done any research into the long wave thermal bands in egg? I haven't personally, um, no, but it would be interesting to know what's going on there. People are using lots of that stuff, well, for temperature, but for um, sort of moisture status to target irrigation. 
Um, but it would be it would be interesting to have more experience with that. Another question: plot size. Is there a limit? limitations to get accurate data um, we are a group in the room previous question okay um, uh, limitations to get accurate data um, I think it depends on what it is you what it is you're after um, so with NDVI that people often want it doesn't matter the ground cover or whatever so if they're if your pixel size is even a meter to them it wouldn't matter because you're sort of getting that um, an indication of, of, of biomass and whatever at that particular pixel but yeah I mean the plots I was working with were two meters wide but the pixel size was so tiny I was getting an enormous amount of information um, but I, I think it depends on the the spatial resolution of the camera that's being used and um, what it is you're after Any other questions? No worries. All right, thanks very much everyone, and we'll leave it there. Okay, cheers.